Someone I want to see. My friend Sherlock Holmes. It's 221B Baker Street. Hello there. Welcome to my review of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Episode 2, The Dancing Men. After the familiar opening credits, we are treated to a perfectly bucolic scene of a lady tending to her roses and a gentleman digging in their stately gardens in Victorian England. The scene is quickly spoiled as the woman sees something and recoils in horror, running to her bedroom and suffering from an apparent panic attack. She retreats into a corner, petrified. The man looks to see what has panicked her and can only find some crudely drawn chalk stick figures in different poses. The dancing men of the title. The lady in question is Elsie Cubitt and the man, her husband, Hilton Cubitt. This perfectly and concisely sets up the mystery Sherlock is about to tackle. Why do the dancing men generate terror in this lady? Well, what becomes clear after just two episodes of the series is that there is a loose structure to each episode, where the initial mystery is usually set up in this opening scene. Whether it remains a mystery throughout depends on how much it drives the story, but it acts as a teaser, and this teaser is an excellent one mostly due to Betsy Brantley's performance as the horrified Elsie. She's most famous to me as appearing as Fred Savage's mother in The Princess Bride, but here she is just a few years earlier in a more prominent role, and within the first three minutes she is excelling. You really get the sense she is frightened for her life in her reactions. The way she tucks herself into the corner of her room is so incredibly real. This then contrasts with Holmes and Watson in Baker Street, with Holmes showing off to Watson in a very funny scene between the two. One thing this series does so well is establishing the friendship and rapport between the two leads. You do not propose to invest in South African securities. How on earth do you know that? Now confess, you are utterly taken aback. I am. Holmes shows off the deductive reasoning to Watson and to us that he is famous for, and as it was far less prominent in the previous episode, it stands out much more here. We see Watson, used to this game, play along and still be impressed by Holmes reaches his correct conclusions. In this sense, it's like a magic trick that the magician explains but how they do the trick is actually much more impressive than the trick itself. Watson then proceeds to tease Holmes, including employing some deductive reason of his own. With a fresh face, an open countenance, and wearing a brown bowler hat. Describing what Holmes' latest client looks like by cheating and spotting him out of the window. This playfulness between the two friends is often missing from adaptations, as Watson is usually the butt of Holmes' jokes, but I think it's so much better to see him played as someone impressed by Holmes and yet not willing to allow Holmes to become too big-headed about it. We still have Watson getting things wrong in the scenes, as he identifies the sketch of the dancing men as a simple child's drawing. But we are in on the secret here, as we know no child's drawing would inspire the fear it did, and so we get to feel a bit like Sherlock here. And yet we only know as much as the pair about what the drawing means. The look David Burke's Watson gives Holmes after he has made his deduction perfectly sums up how the show gets the characters right. Hilton Cubitt arrives, and we, along with Holmes and Watson, learn a little more. Cubitt seems like a jovial and honest fellow, and Holmes has already established he is from an ancient family, so is at least honest about who he is. Cubitt explains how he met Elsie, an American, and Holmes asks probing, potentially offensive questions, as Hilton barely knew Elsie before they married and she is much younger than he is. Holmes is curious that on the day of their marriage, 
Elsie asked Tilton if he wanted to call it off because he knows so little of her, and should call it off if he is at all curious about her past. They were married three years ago, and it had been happy until she re received a letter from America, which she burned without opening. We see this in flashback, which is a convention this series uses to illustrate the considerable amount of exposition the original stories naturally contained. It does deviate from this device, but I'll talk more about that when we get to an episode that illustrates that. I have no issue with it in this episode. It feels perfectly natural for this story. Hubert explains that she has been on edge ever since receiving that letter, but she still won't tell him why she's troubled, and he won't press her on the issue. But, with the appearance of the dancing men, he has chosen to consult Holmes, rather than ask her directly and break his promise. This is such a simple way of both getting Holmes into the story in a way that makes sense, and illustrating that Cubitt is an honest and noble man. Holmes asks him to record any more dancing men he finds and send them directly to Holmes. Watson tells Cubitt not to worry. This is yet another example of how well the show defines the characters with simple gestures, Holmes focusing directly on the physical problem while Watson deals with the emotional problem. If the previous episode was about Holmes learning something about himself, this is one about the audience learning something about Holmes and Watson. Both men recognise the dancing man as a code, or more accurately a cipher, but Watson can't elaborate further as he has not read Holmes's monograph on the subject. You have read my monograph on secret ciphers? Some of it. Uh, I found it rather heavy going. Which leads to another beautiful little character moment for Watson as he considers giving it another go, despite implying he found it boring first time around. The idea that Watson is attempting to become a better detective in this series is something else that is often missed in other adaptations, but it is reinforced as the series goes on. I think it gives far more dimensions to his character that really elevates the show. When Hilton returns home, there are more dancing men, this time on his front door, which he dutifully notes down to post to Holmes. Then, that evening, he stops just short of confronting Elsie. She dismisses the dancing men as a prank, although is entirely unconvincing, and the two eventually embrace in a truly emotional scene. We really see the love this couple shares here, despite this cloud hanging over them, and how this secret seems to be tearing them apart as it tears each of them apart, despite the fact that Elsie remains resolute in not wanting to reveal what the dancing men means. Brantley and Taniel Evans, as Hilton, are so good at portraying the individual sadness they have due to each's inner turmoil, as well as the happiness they bring to each other when they are able to reunite. This happiness is short-lived as Elsie spots a figure clad in black out of the window and Hilton grabs a gun. Elsie tries to stop him, but jealousy has worked its way into his head as he assumes her secret is that she has a lover. You'll come to harm! Or are you afraid he will come to harm? Holmes continues to decode the messages as Elsie acts more suspiciously and Hilton becomes more suspicious. All of this building a certain amount of tension as it's hinted that he may be right in his assumption and the dancing men may end up being of no consequence. Hilton suffers nightmares of the dancing men in a way that is illustrated in a way I'm not a huge fan of, with animated figures of the men dancing through his head. I understand why they did it as part of the language of filming at the time, but it doesn't really stand the test of time. As Holmes continues to ponder, awaiting a telegram from the US that may confirm his theory, 
Hilton's, Hilton awakes to noises in the house and investigates, armed with a pistol. Shots are fired off screen and we return to Holmes, still waiting for the telegram, which arrives, spurring him and Watson to action. My dislike of the dream sequence is more than made up for in the scenes of Holmes just thinking and waiting and how Brett is able to hold your attention while doing very little. It really does look as if you can see him thinking and is a huge testament to how well Brett holds the screen. This is then juxtaposed with the dynamism he shows when the telegram does arrive as he springs over the sofa and it's these two extremes and how Brett plays around the edges of them that really makes me appreciate him more as Holmes than any other actor. Holmes and Watson arrive at Hilton's estate, but they are too late, as Hilton is dead, and Elsie is likely to be arrested for his murder if she recovers from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So, for the second time in two episodes, Holmes has, has failed in his primary mission, this time to solve the dancing men before the Cubit's marriage is ended or harm comes to either of them. So we get our second mystery in this episode. What happened and can Sherlock locate whoever may have perpetrated the crime? Along with this, based on what we've seen of the Cubit's relationship, comes a huge amount of pathos. The story is set up to have us rooting for the Cubits, hoping for Sherlock to bring a happy resolution to the mystery. But poor Hilton is dead, and even if Elsie isn't the one who pulled the trigger, she is still technically responsible for him being dead, for not being more open about her past. It makes the third act much more bittersweet, as we desperately want Holmes to catch the killer and unravel the mystery. But you can't help but feel for poor Hilton. All he wanted was happiness with his wife, and it has brought about his end. When the local inspector informs Holmes of what has happened, he is clearly shaken by the news, not just because he failed to solve the mystery in time, but also by the tragedy, demanding that he is allowed to seek justice. This really goes to the heart of Holmes. His primary driving forces are the pursuit of solving the unsolvable, but also ensuring that we're possible justice is done, at least by his standards. One negative thing I will say about this episode is that it's harder to enjoy the second mystery Holmes is attempting to solve here, as they have made the shootings of the Cubits so incredibly sad. And uh, Mrs Cubit? Seriously wounded. It's an odd criticism to make, I realise, but because it comes so late in the story, after we have come to know them, it's harder to reconcile, to enjoy the mystery solving Holmes does with such relish. He quickly establishes there was a third person who fired the shot that killed Hil Hilton rather than it coming from Elsie, and is able to use the dancing men to lure that person to the house. The person in question is a Mr Abe Slaney a gangster from Chicago who worked for Elsie's father and was betrothed to Elsie, which caused her to flee and seek out a new life. He eventually tracked her down was, and was attempting to take her back with him. In this pursuit, before Elsie could dissuade him, Hilton stumbled upon them and lost his life to a superior marksman. Due to it being self-defence, Slaney will not be hanged, but it's a sad end for all three of the players in this drama. The message being, I think, that honesty is the best policy, and that love being blind can be a positive, as Hilton certainly would have understood Elsie's secret. Even so, it's very melancholic, but brilliantly so, with lovely character moments like when Holmes is grilling the Cubit staff and Watson leans in, advising him to allow the older housekeeper to take a seat, as she was clearly in shock. 
it's one of the most balanced episodes for the two leads who are both characterised wonderfully and given a lot to do. My final criticism though is that Watson's closing monologue is a little too brief as we've spent the whole episode witnessing how kind he is and yet he gives no word of comfort about Elsie other than to say she survived and still lives on the Cubitt's estate. Even with these minor criticisms, it's a superb episode with intrigue, mystery, emotion, humour and heaps of pathos. And so the dancing men, which had so often been the agents of evil, were finally used on the side of justice. Yet another episode that is well worth anybody's time. Thank you. Goodbye.